That's the news. Ow! Okay, we'll start with this. Yesterday, south of the border in Guadalajara, reigning WBA super bantamweight champion Mayerlin Rivas was in action after a rather long stint of inactivity, having not boxed since she won the WBA title in February of 2020, two years ago, before the pandemic even started. This was her first defense of the WBA Super Bantamweight title and her first fight under the Matchroom banner. Matchroom Promotions having signed Mayerling Rivas not that long ago. First title defense of the WBA Super Bantamweight title, first fight as a Matchroom fighter. A night of firsts as the reigning WBA Super Bantamweight champion of Venezuela had considerable ring rust to shake off. She hadn't boxed in roughly two years. Originally, she was supposed to be facing Isis Vargas, but one thing led to another, and Isis was unable to compete on 10 days notice, Karina Fernandez decided to stand in her place. Karina Fernandez, who unlike Mayerling, had boxed in the last 12 months. Karina actually had three fights. Three fights last year, having dropped the decision to Jackie Nava, getting back in the winner's bracket with Letitia Mejia, and capping off the year with Jacqueline Munoz. Karina had a very busy 2021, unlike the reigning champion. Though you never would have known it if you took the fight in. If you saw Mayerling Rivas sticking and moving and walking Karina Fernandez in hooks, hard hooks, hard shots that after just two rounds with Mayerling, Karina was a bloody mess. Karina Fernandez who attempted to be the aggressor attempted to close the gap on the reigning champion coming in face first and she got dropped in the first round. Suffered a gruesome bloody nose that was oozing blood. You know, the entire card was like this. A lot, and I mean a lot of blood was spilled in Guadalajara last night south of the border on that matchroom show. It was an entertaining card overall in reference to this fight. Karina Fernandez Fernandez is somewhat of a credible scalp for Mayerling Rivas given the circumstances that Karina was coming off of consecutive victories. She was certainly more active than the reigning champion the last 12 months. On paper, it was the ideal time to challenge Mayerling Rivas for that WBA title because she'd been inactive for two years. But what do I always tell you? There's more to boxing than what you see on paper. It was a bloodbath is what it was and after about three rounds the ringside doctor took one look at karina fernandez's busted nose and decided to call this whole thing off it was a, a losing effort for the challenger with that mayerling rivas made her first successful defense of that wba title who did it in good fashion mayerling rivas who in many ways is the apex predator at 122 pounds. She's certainly a more experienced fighter than the other three champions at this weight. It's a division of young champions for the most part. The very young and unbeaten Sigeling Lafarve of France, Jamie Mercado, Sugar Neeks, newly crowned IBF champion, Sugar Neeks of New Zealand by way of Australia. Or is it Australia by way of New Zealand? I forget. It seems to be Matchroom's intention to match Ali Scottney, unbeaten up and comer Ali Scottney. Cotford against Mayerling Rivas, it being that Ellie Scottney is in possession of a lesser WBA title, a lesser title, a lesser version of Mayerling's full time. I'm going to be honest, it's too soon for a fight like that. It's too soon to put Ellie Scottney in there with someone as experienced and someone as dangerous as Mayerling Rivas, but that seems to be what the plan is. She's on the WBA route, presumably to challenge the WBA champion. Ellie Scottney has very recently taken a liking to calling out bantamweight IBF champion of Australia, Ebony Bridges, who campaigns in a division below Ellie's, down there at 118 pounds, and we've talked about that here on the channel, how Ellie, she's barking up the wrong tree. I don't anticipate that Ebony's gonna give her a shot, give her an opportunity, not at a time when Ebony says she wants to unify her own division, her own weight class. Better still, Ellie's up there at 122 pounds. She seems to be on the WBA route. Coffee. She's only got five professional fights to Mayerling Rivas is 23. It's safe to say that Mayerling is a lot more experienced than Ellie Scottney is at this time, and I don't think it's a wise decision to put Ellie in there with Mayerling in Ellie's next fight. The ideal course of action in a situation like this is you get Mayerling back out there before this year is out, and you get her back out there against one of the other champions at this weight. You get her out there against Jamie Mercado of Mexico, or Sigaling Lafarve of La France, or Shernika Johnson of New Zealand by way of Australia. You start to consolidate those alphabet titles in the super bantamweight division whilst Ellie Scottney amasses more professional experience because she's going to need it. She's going to need it to beat Mayerling Rivas. The ideal fight for Ellie Scottney would be Spain's own Mary Romero who very recently dished out Maria Secchi her first professional loss and before that she dished out Amy Timlin 
her first professional loss. I think Ellie Scottney is ready for a Mary Romero. I think she can win that fight, but I don't think she's ready for Mayerling Rivas. Not yet. It's too much, too soon. Ellie's coming off that win over former IBF bantamweight champion Maria Roman, and Ellie won that fight in good fashion. She did, but need I remind you that Maria Cecilia Roman is older than Mayerling Rivas. She is a former champion, but she was a champion at bantamweight, not super bantamweight, so she was coming off a loss, and she was moving upstairs. She's older than Mayerling Rivas and a lot older than Ellie Scottney, who's a very spry 24 years old. Cuffed. Because she's so young and she exhibits such a high ceiling already, what's the rush? You got plenty of time to groom her and mold her into an elite level talent, an elite level fighter, world class contender, and a champion. Why rush to put Ellie, who's only 24 years old with only five pro fights in a world title situation, against a dangerous fighter and a dangerous champion like Mayerling Rivas? I think the ideal sequence of fights would be Scottney versus Romero and Rivas versus one of the other three champions at this weight. Matchroom should pick up as many of those belts as they can. Bring them to their side of things. So by the time Ellie is ready to challenge Magyarling or whoever else is there for those titles, she will be a more experienced fighter and it won't just be for one belt, one alphabet title. But now, congratulations to Magyarling for that successful title defense. She's dangerous. We then come to the main event of that same card, Hiroto Kayaguchi's WBA Ring Magazine title defense against Mexico's own Esteban Bermudez, a tough guy and a stubborn customer. Hiroto Kayaguchi hadn't fought in about a year. Very similar situation to the situation we just talked about between Mayerling Rivas and Karina Fernandez. Mayerling hadn't fought in a while, and neither had Hiroto Kayaguchi. Last time he was in action before yesterday's fight was in March of last year. In that way, it's been a little over a year's time, or it had been, since he saw action, and he snapped back to activity south of the border with Esteban Bermudez. And what was an all-action fight? Mid-range to inside fight between two mid-range to inside punchers. I want to say that the work mid-range to inside... Roto Kayaguchi's got arguably the best uppercut in this entire weight class. He's arguably the best mid-range to inside fighter anywhere at or around light flyweight, flyweight, or even super flyweight short of Roman Chocolatito Gonzalez. Outside of Chocolatito, Hiroto Kayaguchi is arguably the best inside fighter at or around these weights. The way he follows those hooks to the body with uppercuts. Countered Esteban Bermudez his lead hand with the overhand right. As Esteban Bermudez would try to jab at Hiroto Kayaguchi, Hiroto would bring over a right over the top. Countering that jab and for the most part dominating the pocket, I want to say that Esteban Bermudez put forth a valiant effort, but he was getting beat up in there. He's got a great chin, takes a great punch. But he was getting beat up in there. Got hit with everything but the kitchen sink. In some ways you could say that the deck was stacked against Hiroto Kayaguchi. Hiroto so far from home, so far from his native Japan. He was the away fighter even though he was the reigning champion. Fighting the Mexican national on Mexican soil and a referee that seemed very much determined to ride his arse. He was on Hiroto Kayaguchi's case all night. You know, it was Esteban Bermudez that was coming forward, leading with his head, coming in head first. But it was Hiroto Kayaguchi who had a point deducted. In a mid-range to inside fight between two mid-range to inside fighters, there are going to be clashes of heads. There are going to be head clashes when guys are banging in the booth the way that these two guys were banging in the booth. And referee, it's circumstantial. The head clashes were circumstantial, as well as the shots that sailed to the back of Esteban Bermudez's head. They were. Roto Kaiguchi had two points deducted. But it did seem frivolous. It did seem like that ref was on his case all night. Roto Kaiguchi had Esteban Bermudez hurt in the seventh, and he got a point deducted in that same round. But he knew that he had his man hurt going into the eighth, and quite instinctively, he closed the show, letting go a salvo of punches as Esteban Bermudez was... He was still hurt from the knockdown in the seventh round. And because Hiroto Kayaguchi had a point deducted by a ref who was on his case all night in that same seventh round, it seems that quite instinctively, he decided to go for the gusto and close the show in the eighth because something nefarious might have been at work. And he did it in stylish fashion. I want to say that I'd like to see more of Hiroto Kayaguchi who campaigns in the light flyweight division, a division that doesn't get the same exposure and the same coverage as Superfly Bantam or Super Bantam lightweight, welterweight, middleweight, heavyweight. These guys down there at Light Flyweight, it don't cost you as much to put together a fight between them as it does a couple of notoriable super flyweights, lightweights, middleweights, etc., etc., you know? Those 
those guys down there. No, don't cost as much to do a fight for them, so why don't we see Hiroto Kayaguchi more often? In many ways, Hiroto Kayaguchi is already the light flyweight division's apex predator. In many ways, he's already the man to beat at that weight, but I'd like to see him in unification matches. There are only two other champions at this weight. Kenshiro of Japan, who holds WBC title. Jonathan Gonzalez, reigning WBO champion of Puerto Rico. The IBF title, that title is registered as being vacant. I'd wager that the fight between Derek Chisora and Cool Brett Pulev costs Matchroom more money than doing a fight between these guys. But you see what it's like when you get these guys at light flyweight in the ring. You see what kind of aesthetic the match yields. How it's an all-action shootout between light flyweights. And I think it's about time that Matchroom needs to keep Hiroto on a busier schedule and get that guy some unification matches. Hiroto Kaiguchi may have been headlining last night's show, but I don't think it would hurt at all to have him fight on the undercards of fights that are happening on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. Cards in the United Kingdom, cards in the United States. The man doesn't disappoint. He's an all-action fighter. One way or another, people are going to be entertained. He needs to be on a busier schedule. He sat out all of 2020, understandably, because of the pandemic and how it affected the sport. Perhaps he wasn't able to get out there. But last year, he only fought once last year, early last year in March. And we didn't see him again the entirety of the year. This was his first fight of this year, six months into the year of 2022. And I'd like to see this guy get back out there before this year is out. Not just once, but maybe two more times. There ain't as many politics to have to deal with and work around it like flyweight. In order to orchestrate unification matches between champions, there really aren't. To my knowledge, Kenshiro isn't with any major promotional outfit in this part of the world. And neither is the reigning WBO champion, Jonathan Gonzalez, who's supposed to be returning to action very soon. The IBF title. That title's vacant. It's up for grabs. Hiroto Kayaguchi has star qualities, star power. They need to make him an undisputed champion. Hiroto Kayaguchi's the only guy campaigning at this weight, the only champion, really, that has a major promotional outfit behind him with a major platform, a global one, for him to fight for. Later on this month, the reigning WBO champion of Puerto Rico, Jonathan Gonzalez, he's going to be in action against Mark Barriga, which translated into Spanish means stomach. What does that have to do with anything? Absolutely nothing. On the 25th, Jonathan Gonzalez is going to return to action as part of a pro box show. Pro box. That's not a major promotional outfit with a major platform deal. And if Jonathan makes it through that fight, I don't see why Matchroom can't make that guy an offer. Make him an offer. Bring him to the zone so he can unify with Hiroto Kayagoshi. Fight won't disappoint. Kid's got star power. He just needs to be more active. They need to showcase his talents more often because he is capable boxer, capable champion. He's a crowd pleaser. And I, I want to see more of this guy. And as many politics at this weight as there are in some others, and these guys aren't as expensive. It really isn't as expensive to do a unification match at like flyweight as opposed to super flyweight or lightweight or welterweight or whatever weight. You know, those light flyweights they don't cost that much. Matchroom needs to get moving on this. Roto Kaiguchi is a young guy. He's only 28 years. Years old, but he's lost enough time, and I think he needs to have a bigger 2022 than 2021 was. Congratulations to him for a successful title defense in what was a fan-friendly fight. And finally, in men's heavyweight news, Michael Benson tweeted, Tyson Fury is reportedly in talks with Saudi Arabian reps to potentially face Oleksandr Yusik versus Anthony Joshua II winner in an undisputed heavyweight title fight, to which Tyson Fury himself replied, this is all news to me. Biggest load of rubbish. Ever. He's essentially denying any notion that he will return. Like all things involving Tyson Fury, there are conflicting reports and contradictions and people aren't quite sure what's going to happen. There's a lot of people still holding out hope that he'll face the winner of that fight, though I maintain my original position. If the winner of that fight is Oleksandr Yusik, the fight won't have as much money involved. It won't generate as much revenue as if Anthony Joshua reclaims those belts. Well, and it's a bigger fight. It's a way bigger fight. It stands to reason that if Tyson Fury is going to come out of retirement for anyone or anything it will be for the biggest financial incentive oh he might prattle on about how he never met a happy rich man and how money isn't everything but rest assured if they're gonna get if they're gonna get this guy out of retirement it'll be for the biggest money fight you guys have heard me say that before I think that Oleksandr Yusik might present a more challenging and tricky style for Tyson Fury who's He's one of the bigger guys in the heavyweight division but he moves like a naturally smaller man that has worked for him for a very 
very long time. But can he out little the little guy? Because that's what Alexander Usyk would be in that fight. He'd be the smaller man. Well, would Tyson Fury decide to come forward on Usyk the way he came forward on Deontay Wilder? We've been talking a lot about base styles here on the channel the last couple of episodes, and how Tyson Fury, he's one of those guys that actually has two base styles. He's got the pure boxer, hit and not get hit, stick and move, outside jabber kind of style, and he's got the come forward aggressive. He was a pressure fighter with Deontay Wilder. In a situation where he's facing a naturally smaller man whose bread and butter is his movement, his ability to outmaneuver his opponents and hit them with punches from awkward angles as he cuts them, hit them with shots they don't see, perhaps it would better benefit Tyson Fury to apply pressure on the naturally smaller man. Tyson Fury's got the gas tank for it. And the physically imposing size, so it is a different proposition crowding Deontay Wilder, who has no mid-range to inside game, he's often off balance, he has poor feet, poor coordination. Outside of the counter right hand, Deontay Wilder really isn't much of a boxer. Tyson Fury crowded him. And it hampered Deontay Wilder's money punch, his big right hand. There's just not as much room to throw it with this guy standing in front of you, bearing down on you. And ward Deontay Wilder out. So by the time Deontay does get that punch off, there's not as much on it. But Deontay Wilder, dangerous puncher that he might have been, he's an easier guy to figure out because he really isn't much of a boxer. He's just not coordinated. He doesn't got feet like Oleksandr Usyk. And bear in mind, Deontay's an orthodox fighter, whereas Usyk, he's a southpaw. Usyk's got a better gas tank than Deontay, too. Pressuring Usyk the way that he pressured Wilder, crowding him, forcing him back. It seems like a very different proposition to me because Usyk and Deontay, they really are very different fighters, wildly different fighters. Better still, it's a fascinating fight, and at this time, I don't know if we're going to get to see it. We'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Of course, Usyk's got to make it past Anthony Joshua for the second time before it even becomes about potentially facing Tyson Fury. And with Anthony Joshua enlisting the aid of Robert Garcia, who knows? Maybe he'll get his belts back. Maybe he'll beat Usyk this time. We've just got to wait and see.